We greet our friends everywhere with Chapter 16 of The Monk of Wittenberg, the story of Martin Luther. This is another in the series, Stories of Great Christians, and is brought to you by the Moody Bible Institute of Chicago. you believe it, Martin? After all these years, I heard today that I only set my cap for you because I was jilted by my first love. Oh, did you think Germany would forget? <laughs> oh, here, take your medicine. Well, the devil take it. Here, Martin. It will be gone before you know it. So for life I swallowed that poison. <laughs> your own daughter, Lena, takes medicine better than you do. Here. Hmm. That is because she does not yet know the power of the devil. <laughs> Crazy woman. How did you come to be in his employ? Same way you did. Now lie down. Mm. You promised me, Martin. You are a wicked witch to play my hymn this morning before I was completely awake. I love it. <laughs> God loves it. Our Germans have sung themselves into church with my hymns. Even the papers have become congregational singing again. Well, let them. It's a great thing to teach your enemies. They've taken my translation of the Bible, too. And, with a few uh, corrections, have put out their translation of the scriptures. Well, it's a feather in my cap. My, aren't we smart? Is uh, your sermon on pride tomorrow? <laughs> no. But uh, if my congregation at church could only hear your sermons at home, they could stop coming to church altogether. Oh, Martin! <laughs> And to think I once paid you 50 guilders for reading the Bible all the way through. You know I wanted to read it. Oh, where are you going? To get the mending. Ever since Hans has been away at school, I haven't half the mending to do. <laughs> oh, he is a good lad. Yeah, he is. You know, Katie, God warms my wretched life at this home. <laughs> In spite of all your bossing and managing. <laughs> Dear Martin... Oh, so much has happened since our wedding. Well, the devil is not idle. Well, it has not all been bad. Uh, I was thinking of the church. So much turmoil, so many councils. What has it brought us? A new church, another church, when the body of Christ is one? But the congregations are much more orderly since they have been under the control of the state. Ah, oh, the peasants forced me to do it. Without church laws and discipline, they acted like they were free of all religion instead of being free of the Pope. They knew nothing, they never prayed, went to confession, communion, learned any true doctrine. It wasn't only the peasants, Martin. You know the princes and nobles were robbing the church lands and property. <laughs> I'd like to have a bit of what they stole. Uh, I thank God again for our pious, gentle emperor. He has made a good church head. Yet what pain it cost me to set up my own papal decrees. Preface to the church constitution drawn up by Martinus Luther. May all pious, peaceable princes not despise the diligence of our emperor and our well-meant love, but obey willingly and not by compulsion of this decree. Where some oppose us and seek to do something different from us, we must separate them from us. Well, there had to be some kind of uniform doctrine, Martin. Who could that be at this hour? <laughs> Maybe a runaway nun. I'm coming! Is the doctor up? Yes, but he's been quite ill today. We were having an argument. Is it students, Kate? Uh, come in, come in. Yes, come in. Uh, uh, Dr. Luther, we did not know you were not feeling well. We could come back. I'm only lying down to please a woman. Uh, please, sit down quickly, or she will have us all prostrate in taking medicine. Thank you, Thank you Thank sir. You. <sighs> but was your argument? Well, it, it wasn't an argument, really. I was telling Carl that in the sacrament of communion, 
the presence of Christ is only in the heart of the believer and not in the bread and wine. This is what Zwingli, the Swiss theologian, teaches, but I know you do not teach it, sir. Then, last Sunday, I preached a sermon on this subject. Then I was angry. Now I'm tired of this dispute. But I shall tell you what I told my congregation. Because I am caught in sin, prisoner to the devil and death, and feel that I am weak and faint, cold in love, impatient, envious, wavered, covered in sin from head to toe. Oh, sir, surely you do not mean yourself. It was for the congregation he said this, stupid. I do mean myself. Therefore, I draw near in communion to find Christ's word and to know it. Here, my Lord has given his body and his blood and bread and wine so that I could be sure my sins are forgiven and that I shall have eternal life. This is the way one should instruct children and simple folk about the sacrament, so they know what to seek there. Then the Lord Christ is truly present. Yeah, he is. Enough, enough. Now, talk will warm the mind, but not the body. Here, have some coffee, Georg, Karl. Martin, would you like some, too? Oh, it would kill me. <laughs> oh, Martin, you've been killed so many times. I doubt if one more time would hurt. I am a little concerned that our lecture on the Book of Romans has developed into a discussion concerning the progress of the Reformation. Tomorrow... We shall continue with the subject of free will. Now, if there are no further questions... Uh, Herr Dr. Melanchthon. Ja, Teil. Uh, you mentioned, sir, that one of the reasons the Reformed Church could not be united again with the Roman Church was that at the Diet of Speyer, the Protestant princes would not negotiate with the Roman Church, but insisted that the confession of their faith be drawn up. For six years, I hoped that the Reformation would be the salvation of the whole Roman Church. Luther was against negotiations with Rome and at Speyer, yeah, yeah, I failed to reconcile the Roman and Reformation Church. Well, uh, was it then that the word Protestant was made? All of this talk will never get us to our course in Romans. It was at a second council, two years later, in 1529, that Rome called the evangelical princes Protestants. That is what we do not understand, sir. Why was the word thought of then? Because the Roman Catholic faith was declared at that day to be the only legal faith. The evangelicals read the protestation and from then on were called Protestants. But, Herr Doctor, I... I, I, I really must declare this lecture adjourned, gentlemen. Look tired, Philip. Is Romans going well? Oh, John, for the past two days we have been off Romans. Your pupils are alert. What is more interesting to them than the Book of Romans? Let us walk along to the study together. I, I would like your advice. Gladly. The students have been pressing me to discuss the development of the Reformation. And why does this distress you? They have heard of the differences in theology that separate Martin and me. They do not know the points on which we differ. And by a discussion of the Reformation, they hope to lead me into theology. I had no idea that the students knew that you and Martin were not in accord. Oh, nor did I. And I do not intend to set up a rifle group to Martin by contrasting Martin's views on free will and predestination with mine. Uh, perhaps you will be reconciled. Oh, never. It has been a long time since we first disagreed. I admire Martin John and love him as a brother. But... <sighs> Have you seen him recently? Oh, yeah. We still work closely together. However, there are some subjects which we do not discuss. Here we are. 
I know Luther teaches that the will of man is not free and cannot help but sin, and that you teach that the will is free but chooses to sin. It is much more than just that. Uh, come in and sit down. Thank you. Right over there. Uh, we first started to disagree 13 years ago. I wanted to bring the evangelicals back into the fold of the church. But Martin simply laughed at the possibility. Later, we began to have arguments about the importance of faith and works. Philip, you blockhead. Sin is unavoidable, invincible, immeasurable. A man must not hide from his sin, try to cover it up by good works. But the real goal of the Christian life, Martin, is obedience to the law. No, 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 no. We are filthy sinners. How can we do good works? Man must do good works, lest he offend the Holy Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit who makes possible the miracle of faith and Martin, good works. the end of the Christian life is virtue. It is faith. Faith, faith. Luther is a hard man to convince. Oh, he is impossible. I have often heard men complain of his stubbornness, but I never realized how unmovable he could be. It hurts him more that we do not agree than anything else. You will betray me because you have not the courage to believe against reason. Well, Master Philip, you know your philosophy. And nothing else. You must admit the place of philosophy in theology. I hack off philosophy's head. Oh, you are impossible to reason with, Martin. It is because you would like to have God follow your way, so you can brag. That is the way it had to be. That is the way I would have it to be done. Martin! I exhort you not to make yourself God, but to fight against that inborn lust for divinity implanted by the devil. Remember, Philip, no religion is so foolish to human reason and so preposterous as the Christian. John, I have spent my life in working out the proofs of God, undoing contradictions. And yet, Martin despises anything more complicated than the fate of a child. Herr Doctor, a messenger brought this note to you and left right away. Oh, thank you. Excuse me, John. Certainly. Oh. Philip, if there is anything I can do. No. It. It is from Frau Luther. Martin is dying. And so we conclude Chapter 16 of The Monk of Wittenberg, the story of Martin Luther. This is another in the series, Stories of Great Christians and comes to you transcribed from the Moody Bible Institute in Chicago. Mm -hmm.